so hi uh that, that's definitely a different perspective today from me being here i know uh this is not it was a slide uh th <laughs> <laughs> thank you uh so i want to start by thanking uh the opogs community the opogs organizers for putting up this event i have been attending religiously all the opogs meetups uh, of course, till now as a participant, uh, and I simply love it. I simply love the like the quality in the production, like this venue, the quality of the pastries, the dinner after, like it's simply fantastic. Thank you for organizing this. Um, uh, I said like, hi, I'm David. Um, I work for a company called Endyet, therefore the Ampersands, and I get the chance to work in the awesome uh, security team at Endyet called the Lift Security which you will know, you'll get to know a little bit better when it's time for Baldwin to speak. I get to, um, to contribute to the Node security project. And also, as mentioned, I've been running LXS, the Lisbon JavaScript. Any LXS attendees here, like in the house? Oh, we have quite a few. Cool, that's, that's really cool. Uh, and I've been doing some stuff also connected to the community in terms of organizing meetups there. Uh, we call it require LX. Uh, it's the logo in the bottom. You can find me on all of those not so impressed faces and sentences with dots in the middle. Um, but today I'm not here to talk about um, security or community. I'm here to talk about something that I've been doing for my um, uh, master's in engineering. Um, uh, basically, um, I'm one researcher in the INS ID uh, research lab in Lisbon. Um, I'm doing a master's in IST, um, the Technical Lisboa. And I've even made a cute logo for my thesis, you can see it up, um, <laughs> uh, which is not common. But so, and what I have to bring here today, like I typically don't speak a lot. Uh, I don't do a lot of speaking engagements, but I have, have something that I'm really excited and I would love to share with you and I get your feedback uh, on this work. It's going to be about uh, resource discovery, but more specifically, resource discovery uh, for the web platform on top of a peer-to-peer -peer overlay network using WebRTC as the layer of transport. And we have a, also a special attendee today, Ferros. I would believe that Matt, senior Matt Science Ferros would approve that this is buzzword compliant <laughs> <laughs> in some sort of sense. Yeah, but, um, but okay, and this is what I bring for you today. But before jumping into the details of the research and what I've built, of course, with JavaScript, otherwise we will not be uh, I will not be speaking about it here. Um, I want just like to do a little build up and assure that we are in the same page um, and like bring you all to the, um, to the idea where that idea started. So like, like years ago, like internet started, well, like I don't want to cite the whole history of the internet, just a little bit uh, about like the World Wide Web. There is this uh, man very famous called Tim Berners-Lee. You might have heard about him. Uh, he did some stuff. Uh, one of them was the HTTP protocol. And the HTTP stands for Hypertext, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And it was a really simple protocol. Basically, up the, you present uh, this protocol a key. It will locate a resource. And it will find a resource for you and retrieve it. Um, it, it could not be simpler. It, uh, like for uh, organizing information, like for, for storing and for retrieval, it could not be a simple protocol. He did the draft and uh, the implementation in all one year. But later I learned that like, the term hypertext that he used for his protocol was actually not coined by him. It was called by Ted Nelson in 1965, so like more or less 30 years before him. And it was just because like, Ted Nelson was working on um, extending a system that was uh, Vannevar Bush Memex, which is like this table here with like, some knobs and stuff. Um, that was a system that was designed to store, organize, and retrieve documents. But this Memex was actually not a real system, just like the design of it. Um, so uh, all of this bubbled up to the internet, like stuff that people have been talking and researching for like 80 years, bubbled up to the internet that we know today and love. Uh, this, this concept that uh, I'm talking about is basically what we know as today as the URL, like the unified resource locator. Uh, is where like what we type in our browsers to find the resource that we are looking for, and this is like this abstraction about key value, uh, locator resource is something that is all in all the levels of computer science, right? Like uh, we are all JavaScript developers here, so like something that we know and love is the JavaScript object. You give it a key, you get it a value. Uh, that's that's how it works. It's simple. So. Like for a, like, well, maybe short period of time, 
Um, that's how the internet, the web worked. Like you would give a resource locator, like if I would like to know what's the recipe for my beloved Francesinha, um, I would have to know where it's located and I would ask this protocol to fetch it for me. But then something happened, like documents became smarter. They, they stopped being just like a document, a piece of information, but actually a conglomerate of several pieces of information gathered on the web. And what happened with this process is that we started moving the, the, um, the responsibility of knowing exactly where the information is from the clients to the server. So like we started having databases, we are starting like having, like the server would be just an index for a database and then the database would have another indexes to know where the information is. And then because the information grew so much and like uh, we started having like multiple databases. So now there's even one more responsibility. Uh, there is even one more level of indirection. And then like, because of all the requests, all that, that was going on. We started adding more servers and then like putting load balancers on top. Like right now the client has no idea where it's stored. It knows that you can fetch it with this locator, but he has no idea. And what, what, this is what we call typically um, a centralized system. Something that like the client knows that like if I send this request somewhere on that, that hand, I will get my information back um, or at least its current state today. And like it, it even gets worse, right? Because like if you really have to scale your application, you might have something like multiple data centers, like, and then you have to deal with stuff like SSL termination between data centers, like it's it just a whole mess. Like the, the, the way to figure this out and like to find actually your resource requires so much uh, effort. Uh, that's like just a, like a mumbo jumbo happening. Um, it, it, it's a whole mess, right? Uh, we know that like, by building systems ourselves. Uh, but so the question appears, like would it be a better way? Like can we improve? Um, it's hilarious, right? Like this informational stuff. <laughs> um, would it be a better way uh, to do this, um, this resource discovery? That's all we are talking about here. Um, well, I'm not sure if there is like 100% better way, but we can definitely learn something from what is known as the decentralized networks as opposed to the centralized networks. When we talk about centralized networks, it's very common for people to think things like BigTorrent, right? Like peer-to-peer -peer networks, they are like decentralized. They, um, they don't require necessarily a central server uh, or a central entity to control all the information uh, and tell us what it is. Other thing that's very famous right now, it's Bitcoin, right? Um, and if you are even like in I, the software business for a while, um, you might remember things like LimeWire or Kaza, right? Or even this little fellow, Imu. And just like making sure, like, let's see how, what is the, my reach with this one. Do you remember this, these guys? Mola de Convertiva. So, yeah, and like all of these systems have one thing in common when we uh, analyze them. Like, they are only as interesting as their resource discover, discover, discovery capabilities uh, remain efficient when we need to scale up. Like if the system loses its efficiency when we have start having like millions of nodes, millions of peers, and zillions of resources to, to find, the system loses it, stops being interesting for us. Um, so, but one of the things I wanted to bring here today is like because these like peer-to-peer -peer networks is something that we don't do from the day-to-day -day when we are developing our web apps, our web services, our mobile applications, desktop applications. So I just wanted to give a, like a quick overview uh, of what happened in the last 15 years in peer-to-peer. -peer. And like it starts with Gnutella. It was something made inside AOL. Um, it's a peer-to-peer -peer no network. And it's a very interesting example because it's very Edonkey-ish. So it's very close to what we use for Emu. Uh, and like, no, nothing better than an image to explain this. Uh, so this is like a Gnutella network looks like. You can see like it's completely random, like it's completely a mess. Uh, there is a no, no notion of, well, like a node connects and like, okay, it's connected, but there is no implicit way to organize the nodes or organize the data. Uh, as again, like 2000, 2001, uh, top topology is random. It's really slow. And I will explain in a second why. And uh, because the routing and search is done by using floating uh, with a TTL and op counter. So just giving a quick example to for you to understand how this worked back then was like if I had uh, if I was this node in the yellow arrow and I wanted to find a resource that was in that peer with a black flag, 
And again, uh, I want to emphasize that we are not talking about finding peers. That's not the interesting uh, concept of peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks. It's about finding resources. Well, the, the resource can be in any peer. I just want to get to it. Um, so in a GNUtella type network, what would happen? I would start floating my peers with my request. So I would first ask uh, this first peer because it's my direct link. And then this peer would ask uh, his other like friends, his other peers connected to him. Um, and then like again, floating, floating, floating. Uh, and then what happened? Like we are really close. You can see that we are really close to find our resource. Like we can get excited. Like we are going to get, I don't know, our, our recipes for Francis Uh But that, what happened, and that's why it's so inefficient, is like you cannot really um, cope with the infinite uh, floating because that will just overload the network and crash it. So you have to put a TTL, a time to live, or an op counter. So like what happens here is like, they just drop the message because it already jumped so much and like we were close and then creates a, like a, a false negative that the resource doesn't exist. Um, and again, like, well, this, 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 this doesn't seem very interesting, very useful, right? Um, so again, this is not the, our solution for the centralized problem. Uh, then there was an evolution, GNUtella 06, um, and that, this is even closer to what we knew uh, when you used the mool around here, uh, introduced the concept of super nodes. And super nodes are basically uh, aggregate what are called the leaf nodes. And these super nodes have the information, the indexing information for um, the data that's stored on the, the leaf nodes that they are responsible for. This reduces significantly the ops because if I am like any node in the network, I don't have to ping all every other node, I just to ping the super node that's connected to that node. So it reduces significantly the number of ops, um, but also creates centralization points of failure, right? Because like if one of the super nodes crashes, then like all the other nodes is like, go, oh, what's up? Like, what I'm going to do now? Uh, and still like, there is still false positives, false, ne false negatives, uh, because still there is still the op counter, like um, doesn't really work that well. So the problem in this type of networks and that this networks is something that we characterize as unstructured because there is no implicit manner to organize information. I just, I'm up here, I have some info, like if you want it, ask me, like if, uh, if you don't know that I have it, ask someone that knows that I have it. And there is this kind of confusion and there is no kind of a nice way uh, to be deterministic. Like I'm not even sure how many ops that I have to um, traverse in order to get my info. Uh, but don't worry, like there is more stuff, like I know that this f feels very discouraging, but there is also the opposite, which is structured peer networks. And the structured word comes from the implicit manner how we organize the data. Uh, and the example that I bring to you today that might be very familiar uh, if you use databases as DynamoDB or React. There's like any DynamoDB users or React here? If, okay, a few. Um, so this example is Cord. Well, has anyone else heard about Cord in their lives? Like this makes, okay, a few as well, nice. This means that I have some new stuff to share to you. Um, so like Cord is, was like the revolution in like peer-to-peer -peer networks. Uh, it's like the Dynamo DB paper for peer-to-peer -peer networks uh, in the beginning because it introduces the concept um, of a DHT, which is um, referenced in the literature as the holy grail of peer-to-peer -peer networks. And like a distributed hash table, DHT, uh, well, we know hash tables, right? We know that if we give a key, we get a value. Uh, distributed hash table, like if we give a key, we get a machine which has that value. Uh, is that simple, basically. We just have to find a way to create this DHT and to actually find out which is the machine that has this valuable. It's highly scalable. Um, we don't need to know all the nodes in the network in order to properly root and to have a deterministic way to find the resource that we are looking for. And well, other characteristics like each node has a unique identifier. You use IDs for node based on the SHA-1 hash. And that has a specific reason because it's proved that SHA-1 um, creates an uniform distribution. So if I have 1,000 documents and if I run a SHA-1 across all these 1,000 documents or like 1 million documents, um, I will see that the distribution of IDs is going to be like 
uh, across all the available namespace, across all these 160 bits that are available for me. So that gives, a, gives us not only or implicit uh, way to do lookups and organize data, it also gives us implicit load balancing, which is a really cool feature. So Cord is awesome. Um, how does this work? Because like, I'm just talking, images help a lot on this exercise. So you have to like, visualize Cord as a, a ring. Like, so you have 160 bits, that's just one dimension, but like, let's curve it and make, make a ring. Um, and just for example purposes, uh, instead of like picking a, a ring with 160 bits, I am going to pick one with three bits. So it's easy like, to do the math and like, to understand uh, how this thing works. Um, here I'm presenting a network that has four nodes. By the way, if like, something sounds confusing or if I'm going too fast, just please raise your hand and ask something. Um, I'll be glad to answer. Um, so we have a ring, we have uh, three bits, three bits gives us eight available IDs, right? Um, we, I have, well, I'm assuming that I have four nodes in my network right now. So I have to find a way that I can find the other nodes, I, that I can root messages between these nodes. Uh, the typical way to, um, to find an ID of a node or at least to attribute its identifier is by hashing the IP because when the protocol was designed it was just like for public area networks. Uh, of course you can have add any level of entropy that you want like IP, name, browser type, machine time, whatever. Um, the way that this works is uh, each node is responsible for one segment of the hash ring. Uh, this means like Node, in this case, I, I put some colors, I don't know if you can see well, but like node one is responsible for IDs that are uh, exclusive um, of zero and like all of IDs still one. Uh, node three is responsible for IDs, for example, IDs that fall into the category two and IDs that fall in the category three, uh, and therefore for other nodes, like the six has a little bit more responsibility than the other two nodes. Um, but well, eventually, because the nodes get distributed evenly, again, because of the SHA-1 dis uniform distribution, every node gets like a similar amount of, data, of responsibility for it, for, for it to store. Um, and also, uh, because of the way that this is organized, we know if I want the, the document which ID is 2, I know that I have to contact node 3, because that's, that's his responsibility right now. Um, so let, let's see how, how can I effectively do this because right now I, I can say, okay, I know that like six has, is responsible for four and five, but how do I reach to six? Do I have to know, do I have to have the clear state of the network? Uh, do I have to have an overview? Uh, if I had, that would not make it so efficient, right? Not so interesting because like if I have one million nodes, do I have to have a connection to all of them? That would be crazy and not scalable at all. So. The minimum for this to work is that each node has to uh, know what we call the successor, basically the node that comes after um, itself on the network. And here we can see that like zero knows one, uh, one knows three, uh, and three knows six, and six knows zero. Uh, by knowing, I mean like they know an IP and a port that they, they can contact the other node. Uh, so if, for example, if node zero has, has to store, is looking for a document, uh, which ID is for, is going to, hey, node one, uh, could you forward this message to the node that's responsible for the ID four? And like, no, node one will say, oh, well, this is not my responsibility, let's just push this forward. And node three will do the same. And then when node six uh, receives the message, oh, okay, like, this, this is my responsibility, like, uh, do you want to read? Okay, let me see if I have the document. Uh, if I have, well, I'm going to transfer it to you. If I don't have, I was just like, okay, the file doesn't exist, right? The 404 that we'll, we know. Um, but this will not be efficient. Like you definitely can see right now, I have like one connection between every two nodes. But if I had one million, should I like do around all of the ring to find my document? That like, for example, um, if a node zero would have to find um, a, a document that's on the node to a power of 160, which is like the node previously to him, he would have to go through two to the power of 160 uh, messages, ops, to find that document. That will not be efficient. So what some really smart guys did um, was to design, like to do some math. Uh, so I'm going to do some math, sorry about that. Uh, and they found a way uh, out to maximize, minimize the number of ops that you have to do in order to find um, 
to find the resource that you're looking for. And they called it the finger table because like, it looks like fingers, right? Like I'm pointing to this and that one and that other one. Uh, so all this, this, um, like all this node zero has these connections to node one, node three, and node six. Why, why specifically those, these nodes? Um, and that's what I want to explain to you. So it starts with the table, the finger table, as the name suggests. Um, and given these three, uh, these two formulas, uh, we can root effectively. What, let me explain how this works. So um, the, the, start, uh, the start function basically tells us, OK, if I have to uh, send um, a message, a value, to a node that's bigger, uh, equal or bigger, then the start value, um, I'm going to, well, I'm going to explain this in a better way because I have, like, I have images and uh, ways to show you. So what I have to know is like, I, as the node zero, I am interested to know what's the best candidate that I should send my message to. And that is given by the, um, the interval. The interval is like, if it falls on this category, I'm going to send to this node specifically. If it falls on this, this interval, I'm going to send to that node specifically. Um, the, the number of rows in a finger table is equal to the number of bits that are being used. Um, that's simply, and I can explain why, because that simply means that like, if I have 160 fingers, I can at least traverse the half of the, um, the hash ring uh, in one, one hop. Um, we can see the formula. Again, like I said, that it's going to be math. Like the M value is the number of bits. The N value is the number of the node that we are uh, doing, like, research, like finding the finger table out. And, and K is basically a value that varies between one and the number of bits. So in this case, one, two, and three. Uh, and I will just like run this formula uh, once for each, uh, for each K. Um, so like to find the first row, uh, I'm going to do the interval uh, formula. We can see that like we have node zero. You cannot see my mouse, right? That's, that's a pity. Uh, so you can see that like I'm going to do that for node zero and like some two plus k uh, minus one. That's like one minus one. That's going to be zero. So like it's going to be one mod of eight and. Uh, that's where the start value comes from. And then I do that for the next value, and the result that I get is a 2. So now uh, I know that the, um, for that respective interval, so between 1 and 2, if I have to send a value that falls into that category, uh, I have to send it to my, the node that I know as the number 1, uh, basically push it forward. And I do that for all the other uh, rows in the table, and I basically end up with a, a finger table like this, uh, as you can see. So like node zero, if he has to root a message with value two or three, he sends it to three. If he has to root a message within value four, uh, five, uh, and six, uh, four, four, five. Yeah, if he has to root a message between four, five, six, or seven, he roots to um, number six. And you might, I don't know if this is confusing, especially the final row for you. Um, it definitely might be because you are thinking like if he wants to find, um, if he wants to send to number seven, uh, why would he send it to number seven? Like zero is responsible for number seven, right? Like why, why, why would the zero follow that message if he is already responsible? The thing is, as I said, like there is no need for a node to know the clear state of the entire network at a single point in time. So the node seven might exist. The, the zero uh, node doesn't have a finger for it. So what's going to happen is like zero is going to send it to a node six, and then eventually if node seven is there or not, because it might join or drop. Um, if it drops or if it was not even there, six is going to do okay. Like now I'm going to send this message, uh, the message with an ID seven to node zero, and then node zero is going to say, okay, like if this reached to me, it, it means that like node seven didn't exist. So I'm going to receive and like declare that this message that I'm responsible for it. Does it make sense? Like cool. Uh, hope so. Um, okay. So now we 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 know how unstructured and structured peer-to-peer -peer overlays uh, work, right? So um, and I promised in the beginning that this will be resource discovery uh, on top of the web platform, and and that will be not fun if like. That will not work if the, the web platform um, had the only model that we 
but it's great also speak like the HDB model, like which is like very client server uh, ish. Like you cannot really establish connections between browsers. You don't have access to the TCP stack, right? So well, what happened recently? Well, maybe what two years ago? For us can confirm two years ago, uh, there was a new technology that started that enables uh, peer to peer in the browser, and that name of the technology is WebRTC. Um, uh, WebRTC is an API, a simple API that um, the browser, JavaScript in the browser can use uh, and it enables vi voice, video, data and data transfer between browsers in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. So you can actually connect from one browser to another without the need to like uh, have a mediator in the middle. Like you, you can just like forward directly. This has like great impact in like video quality, voice quality uh, and also it enables really cool projects um, for example, well, I have to mention, right? Uh, like, it was very cool projects. For example, one of them is WebTorrent.io, which you can know all about because Ferris is it today. So you can definitely think him over dinner. So, but I just wanted to give like a quick overview of what WebRTC is and like explain you how it works because this talk is not really about WebRTC, it's about peer-to-peer. -peer. So we, WebRTC, a session in WebRTC means um, that's like a, a caller and a colleague, again, both browsers can communicate directly. The only thing that we have to do externally is uh, to share what we call the signaling data. And signaling data are basically, uh, it's offers that both browsers share. If it's like to um, negotiate a codec for like a video or a voice uh, connection, or like to tell the other browser, hey, you can connect to my, this port on this IP. Um, and uh, as you might be guessing, like uh, telling another browser that you might connect to this port in this IP when you're talking about a browser and typically that's a browser it's like in a, on a laptop and a laptop is uh, inside the like a local area network so that it, that means that that requires some process right that requires some uh, extra legwork to make it work so that's what WebRTC is solving it's solving that all that problem for developers the way it works basically you, this is a typical scenario we have two peers they are behind a net um, Peer one wants to establish a connection with uh, peer two, so he's going to ask an external server. Um, basically, he's going to punch a wall through the net and, hey, can you tell me what's my public IP so I can tell this other guy? Um, and I sent her, yeah, I, I can tell you that. Uh, your IP, this message arrives from certain IP, and so like now the peer one can create this software uh, with all of the things that the other peer needs for it to connect. Uh, the signaling data is shared across an external channel. Like this external channel can be whatever you want. It can be a floppy drive. It can be like, I don't know, you can like say it out loud or you can use something like WebSockets or like you can use web technologies, of course. Uh, what I mean by this is like you don't really, literally you don't really don't need a server to establish your peer to connection. You just have a way to share the information and typically that would be a server um, somewhere. So like the peer two gets this information and say, oh, like this guy wants to connect to me. So that, that's cool. So I'm going also to find, uh, find my IP address and create an offer for him. And then we have to use this side channel um, to, to communicate with peer one. And once that happens, bam, there is a data channel uh, between both peers, data or video or voice, whatever you want. And they can communicate without any other um, server talking. Uh, this relay server that you see in here in the middle though, is because like some networks are really weird. So like you have to have a relay server in order to reach the other peer. You know, like kind of enterprise networks with a lot of restraints and a lot of DMZs and private areas and VLANs and that, that kind of stuff that makes things hard. But yeah, so so that's WebRTC. Cool enough? Yeah, everyone got it. Cool. I have like a, a very simple demo for this one, which is like just like establishing the 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 two offers and like copy pasting so you could really understand that there is no need for a server but i guess that we are short in time today so um and i'm talking too much as usual um so okay so now we know peer-to-peer -peer networks we know how to effectively scale a network and how to add a million nodes without it even losing its efficiency and keeping it deterministic we know that like the platform that we love to develop and like coding the language that we love JavaScript uh, um, can do peer-to-peer. -peer. How can we merge these both worlds together? And like, what would that look like? Um, and that's what WebRTC Explorer is. Uh, something that I've been developing 
uh, for well for some months now for I think uh, September October and WebRTC Explorer in one pretty image or at least I consider it pretty um, looks like this you can see all of these uh, hexadecimal values are actually browser nodes and all of these links um, are are basically data channels between these browser nodes so there is no need for pinging a server hey can you tell this other browser this information uh, like if it's I don't know if it's a cat picture or like if you are building a chat application you can use all the infrastructure that all the the capabilities that the browser has to transfer data uh, WebRTC Explorer is not WebRTC Cord although it's Cord inspired and there is a reason why I didn't call it Cord because um, it does use Cord routing scheme so everything that I just explained uh, uh, in, um, earlier applies in a way that uh, WebRTC Explorer works. Um, use WebRTC for data transport and WebSockets for signaling. Um, and I just implemented it with 40 bits IDs. Like virtually it could be the, the ID size you want, but like to use over that, it means that I would have to use a big num uh, library in JavaScript and like, well, like why, like 40 bit IDs have so many, it's like such a big address space already. Uh, so I, I just thought like it, this would be enough. Yeah, it is. Um, but again, I, um, it's not a full cord because I did some experiments before WebRTC um, Explorer, I did WebRTC Ring, which was like a simpler version, but I discovered that like when you start uh, like opening more than 50 data channels in one browser and like sharing like 2,500 messages for ray tracing, the thing breaks. So uh, what I did by what I did, uh, so what I mean by a, it's a flexible cord, it's because instead of like doing the, the full range of fing fingers and like doing all of them, because each, each finger means a data channel in the WebRTC world. And like if you have a finger out, it means that you are going to have a finger in. So if you have like 160 bits, 160 fingers, that means at least 320 data channel connections. That's a lot, and it breaks. So, um, well, well, this way it's flexible. If two months from now uh, there is a release that enables more data channels, we just can change the number. So how does it work? Um, Core, the, like the paper, uh, explains a lot about routing messages, like the, all the signaling, all the node joins, all the node leaves, how you should handle that. It's all up to you. Uh, so that's basically what I did in for the WebRTC specific scenario. So like a typical, um, like, so like this is JavaScript, right? So like the, typically it would require a module, like it's Browserify compatible, if you like Browserify. Um, you would require the module, like you would give like a signaling URL, basically the server that's going to ch exchange the data between peers so that data channels can be established. Uh, you create the peer uh, with this config, like just one, one property. And like you can listen for events like registered, ready uh, and message. The register, like when we execute, like this now inside the module, uh, we execute um, uh, a call called the S register to the server to tell, hey, I'm, I'm an available peer for the others to connect. And like the, the server replies back with the C register saying, hey, like cool, your ID is this ID on the network. Uh, the on ready event is when like we at least know one other node in the network. So it means that I'm available now to send messages. Uh, um, the on message event is when I receive a message that's my responsibility. Again, like if the message is for ID number three and I'm number zero, I'm just going to forward. Like it's not going to pop on this on message. Um, that happens underneath. And like the register function is again, as I said, like just to, to bootstrap the whole thing. Um, the way it works, like nodes keep joining, keep registering on the signaling server, and the signaling server I see nodes joining is going to say, okay, like this guy, um, a new node joined, and I, now this, this node is a better finger for this other node. So it's going to tell, hey, like you have to update your finger uh, because like in an optimal state, you, you should route your messages to this guy. Um, and then like the nodes that have to have uh, finger updates receive this message. The way that they both connect, well, is as you might expect in a WebRTC at the channel, one sends the offer, the other accepts the offer, it tells like I accept your offer, server says the offer is accepted, and then another channel, this fifth link here, it's created. Any questions? How good so far? Can we go to the demo? So like show it working, because that's the fun part, I guess. Um, so, so let's 
then I have to mirror this thing. Blah, blah, blah. I never. <laughs> exactly. That's how, how you know that I don't do a lot of presentations because I'm like trying to figure out how to mirror my screen. <laughs> and there you go. Cool. What happened? What is it? Can I close this? Yes. Uh, and this. Uh, oh, my mid thing. No, this is the way. No. Um, okay. <laughs> Can you? What happened? Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Um, okay, so several components to this whole infrastructure thing. Um, I have a signaling server, as I said, like the, the, the thing that like uh, establishes the connections between nodes. That's not very interesting. Although there's a lot of math, but like just going to keep it running. And as I explained, I have like an example here of WebRTC Explorer. Um, that's like it's pretty much how to show you on that side, right? So, so require the Explorer. Uh, I have like, this logging through, so I can see the messages and I, I can have some visibility of what's happening underneath. Then I uh, I create a new peer for the specific browser instance. I just set it as global because I'm using Browserify and typically encapsulate, so I, I want a global variable so I can like use it in. I will show you. Um, <laughs> Uh, register, ready, uh, on events, console log, I'm like consoling log, and then I register. So let's see this working. Um, what? Ah, zoom. Because in mine it looks freaking weird. Uh, uh, this, this is... Uh, I... What have I done? Okay, this is, wait, 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 okay. Again, so just make sure that I, I can see whatever is happening. Uh -huh, snap and turn, node index, <coughs> server. Yeah, okay, cool. So now if I go to localhost 22, uh, I can see, okay, like socket IO connection salvage, like I connected the signaling and I'm registered with the ID that. Um, I, I'm not in the network yet, uh, right? Because there is only one peer. So let's like, connect another one. Now they are like, okay, uh, registered, okay. Please update your finger because there is another node in the network. You can see like you should update your finger to the other one. Uh, and then connect, accept offer. Well, I could do better logs, but um, now I can, like, I can just do a simple test. Like if I want to send a message to another, another peer, uh, just a simple one. So just sending a message to him. Uh, no, 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 don't break the things. Uh, Hey, how is it going? Uh, well, I send, like I say, okay, next stop in my finger table is this guy because it's a very simple uh, finger table, right? And well, I received, hey, how's it going? Cool. Uh, and this guy contacted me. But it gets more interesting because I can now start spending more nodes. And like, yeah, I can see, okay, finger update. And then like, this guy updated as well, their node. Uh, and then I have kind of like a warm up period. I don't start like bootstrapping all the fingers at once because like if you have three nodes, why establish five data channels or 10 data channels? Like I have like, uh, that's a configurable value on the signaling server. You could put it to one, I have it to four. Um, so like now like you can see that I have some fingers that are repeated because again, I have so little nodes. Uh, but um, so what comes to interesting because like this is not very visible, right? Like you're just, Trusting me, um, I have something that I've did. Okay, is this one uh, that I call the visualizer that basically tells me the the state of the network. <coughs> okay, yeah. this is my expectual D three GS skills to do this. <laughs> well, you can you know that like this is a connection from here to here because the arc is out. I wanted to put an error, but I don't know how to put an error. So <laughs> 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 it took me a lot of time. Uh, it was hard. Um, if, you, if you have some spare time and if you know D3, I would gladly help. So like this is a set of network and I can, I, I can connect more nodes and like um, again, like the same thing. And then I can go here again and visualize and it's going to be different. Now I have, like you see, the network is, a, is evolving. Uh, there is like more and more they are um, 
leveraging the fact that like the uniform distribution uh, and like I can still well if I want for example node again like I can see that nodes this node doesn't have a direct link so it's going to root to this one and to that yeah you ah you can see uh, that this is not present keynote uh, so I can see that ro no, node f01 doesn't have a direct link so it has to root through node zero a e so let's see that working um, yeah so peer global well, well, wait is this the yeah the f1 send did I copy it well <coughs> yes uh, I know that I don't have a direct link, uh, and I send, and I can go. Well, now I have to find which one was it, not this one. Um, but I can say that this did the work, right? Like next stop, this guy is the zero. It received it. It forwarded it. And where is the, the two guy? Oh, this is the two guy. Hey, and so um, next stop, it's me. Like next stop, it's me. Um, again, I could do better walks, um, but. Um, but I received the message. This this one is being printed on the my peer, like the, the, the abstraction, right? This not like inside logging. Um, so yeah, like you can. So what is this useful for? <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's the, the the question of the day. Um, this is useful for first, like you don't like first you are using the resources of the own network. You don't need like one thousand machines to like like build a chat app that's like world scalable, whatever. Because like no, just like forward messages between each other. It guarantees you privacy if you are, that's one of your concerns because WebRTC data channels and video and voice are all uh, encrypted. So basically I'm like anti-NSA, and cia kind of <laughs> communication. And do you have a question? Okay. Um, and like, <laughs> if, you, if you know Dynamo or DB, uh, DynamoDB or RIAC, uh, you will see that the paper for DynamoDB uh, actually uh, quotes cord uh, in a way that it works. So you literally, well, I don't want to say this uh, this way, but like you could do a database on top of this system where, uh, for example, me, instead of like having a machine or a shard where I store my user data, I could just hash my email and then I would ask, uh, can, you, can you deliver, can you get me my user data? And I could root to the node that is responsible for my user data and I could be my name and I don't know, my age and it would retrieve it, the information to me. So I would not have to worry with those concerns, which is more or less like, again, Dynamo and React work underneath. Um, I did a, like a other simple demo, uh, bec again, just to show that this might be useful for something, uh, which I call the WebRTC Explorer browser process. Um, and the WebRTC Explorer browser process is basically a simple uh, <laughs> module that you can like, um, create what we call um, a gridlet, and a gridlet is a blob of data plus a function that should be run on that data. And I just like create this gridlet and I send it to the network and tell like, hey, some node with a random ID that I've not ever heard about, could you run this for me and like use your computing power uh, and tell me the results and that node will do it for you. So um, let me show you how this works. I have here an example, example, start out. Uh, you can see what I did. You cannot see what I did. Um, you can see what I did? Okay. So again, same story, uh, browser process. So this is an abstraction on top of WebRTC Explorer. Uh, again, like you have to do the signaling URL. Um, I, I say like I want to participate on, on jobs. Uh, every, like probably you are familiar with um, Boeing-based architectures like SETI at home, folding at home. You know, like that's a, like a typical um, dis distribution of jobs within a centralized way. You connect to a server, you request for a job, and then you get the results. This is more kind of way, but in a, more in a peer-to-peer -peer uh, way. Uh, so you don't have to connect to a central server. And I, I'm going, I have this function here, which has like some data, like an array of 10 numbers. And then I have like the task to be run, like some plus one, it could be anything really. Uh, and I want to use two peers for my job. So I'm going to distribute this evenly to two peers, uh, and then I when I when I execute and I have the results back, I'm going to say whoo, and the results. That's what's going to happen. Uh, so if I still can uh -huh, clear, let's kill all these nodes. Du -du -du yeah. Du -du 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 -du. 
yeah, we, I still need the signaling server running. So, duh, duh, duh. So again, well, uh, well, if I need two nodes to run, like I have two nodes to run in a job, and I always say use all other two nodes except not that are not me. So I need three for this to happen, um, really. So or I, I could have more and just use two, whatever. Okay, so all nodes are connected. Uh, I, I'm ready, ready to do this. Let's go. So start. <laughs> Done. Uh, <laughs> exciting. So what happened was like uh, you can see that like all the other nodes like task. Oh, I received the task. Like I have like one tiny blob of data. I have to send this number to this function, and I'm going to execute it for you. And like use my computer resources uh, that are available and completely wasted because I don't use it um, that much. And yeah, it kind of creates the opportunity to do some like again distributed jobs platforms on what is the most ubiquitous platform of them all, which is the browser. And it removes like that need for installing screen savers or apps that like run in the background and consume resources. And yeah, um, I did another thing. So um, this browser, uh, browser process is really recent. Uh, what I did for WebRTC Ring and where I got mo most of my results was like you can see like more state of the art, peer to peer, blah, 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 <laughs> math, 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 math. And then you can see that I did, what I did here was uh, using uh, browsers to do ray tracing jobs. So, and actually rendering Pokeballs. I don't know if that's interesting for you. Um, <laughs> but you can see the results here, the number of browsers used, how I got a speed up, like a normal job in the browser would take like 42 seconds or something or 20, 24, 24 milliseconds. And like, for example, with five browsers, um, I would have speed up three times because I would do 7.5 milliseconds uh, with five browsers. Um, and of course, this is a balance because like it's a five browser process with 25 un computing units. So I will divide the ray tracing job in 25 pieces and send it. When I did that for 2,500, and there you can see the spike when it reaches the 25 browser value, the 50 data channel case that I told you about, uh, it starts like getting worse. And it gets worse because like if you have to route uh, 2,500 messages for a thing that's like this big, uh, it gets inefficient. You're always adding network. Um, but yeah, like this is the, those are the typical computer science problems. Uh, and you can see here that like with more a network delay and 2,500 computing uh, units, like I could not even do the 25 uh, browser thing because it will just break. I never see, saw it end because it will break. Uh, and you can see more maths and like graphs and conclusions and stuff. So yeah, like and also because it's important to know. So as I told you, this is an adaptable uh, core dish like network. So it's interesting to know um, how many, um, what is the maximum op number for my uh, network disposition? Again, because I have the network disposition available on the config value, which, dun, 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 sorry, go this word. So you can see that I'm like picking for this specific network IDs, uh, the K value 0, 10, 20, 30, 47. And I want to be able to do this more efficiently and like do several generations and see what's the most efficient one for this specific case. So I created what I call the simulator. Uh, and the simulator is pretty, uh, like pretty close to the the visualizer, like you can choose the number of nodes, and then like oh, I want you to use finger zero, maybe 10, 20, I don't know, 40, and I, I just for viewing purposes, uh, and like simulate, and then poosh, and like appears like a whole network of nodes, and again like I had some brilliant like visions for this, like I would like to click a node, and I, like you just like highlight the fingers of that node, like the arrows and like colors, but, but I really I'm bad at front end, as you can see, I, I like. I, I cannot do it, um, but like it gives you some idea, um, and the the network is represented. I can do it uh, mathematically, like find what is the max mean number of ops, and that's what I. That's what I. So I'll add to you. Uh, these are like some of the papers that I referenced during my presentation. 
and also I mentioned more when I spoke about Gridlet, and that's what I got. <laughs> Thank you.